Okay. Um, why don't we get started? Um, thanks again for you all joining today. Um, you know, we're we're within a week of Halloween. Uh, it's also Bat Week, um, so it seems like a really good time to have a webinar on bats. Uh, and today's topic is the state of knowledge on bat populations, which um, for those of you interested in in bats, this is this is a topic that we've all struggled with over time, and I think we're making some pretty good progress on in the last couple of years. Uh, let's see how I can advance. So, um, uh, NREL is, is um, this is part of NREL's EcoWind program, which uh, stands for Enabling Coexistence Options for Wind Energy and Wildlife. Um, I put our web page on um, the slide here. And this program focuses on land-based wind interactions, um, uh, particularly with respect to bats, raptors, and grouse. Um, today's webinar will be recorded or is being recorded and will be uploaded to TFIS, uh, the website shown here. Um, and TFIS is a great resource for land-based wind, offshore wind, um, and international uh, wind through the IEA um, wind program called REN. Uh, TFIS also has uh, close to 5,600 wind and wildlife documents, 116 recorded webinars, and a new monitoring and mitigation technologies tool um, that has over 60 technologies and the literature that um, like studies and 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 publications that go along with validating those technologies. So I encourage you to visit the site um, to to check out that tool and um, any of the the reports and publications and recorded webinars that are there. Um, we have a, a, a great set of speakers today um, uh, to talk about bat populations and the research that has gone into to trying to understand. Um, uh, the status and trends of bats. Uh, we have Dr. Amanda Hale. Um, she is currently a senior research biologist with Western Ecosystems Technology. Prior to joining West, Dr. Hale was a professor of biology at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. Dr. Hale has more than 25 years of experience conducting field and lab-based research and has been investigating the effects of wind energy on birds and bats since 2008. In addition to serving as a science advisor to the Renewable Energy Wildlife Institute, Dr. Hale is a member of the Bats and Wind Energy Cooperative Scientific Advisory Committee and is an active member of several scientific organizations, including the American Ornithological Society and Wildlife Society. Juliet Nagel has been studying bats for nearly 20 years across Canada, the US, Panama, Costa Rica, and Belize. She received her undergraduate degree in wildlife management and ecology at the University of Stevens Point in Wisconsin, her master's degree in zoology at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She is currently finishing her PhD at the University of Maryland, using genomics and acoustics to inform conservation of threatened bat species. Bethany Straw is a biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Fort Collins Science Center. She serves as the assistant coordinator of the North American Bat Monitoring Program, providing leadership uh, and directing program operations across international boundaries. NABAT is a continental scale, collaborative, multifaceted program aimed at addressing the historic lack of information on bat species status and trends. And John JK is a US Fish and Wildlife Service biologist working out of the headquarters office in Washington, DC. He served in a few different roles within the ecological services program since starting his career with the service in 2012. He is now a project manager on the species assessment team, working on a variety of Endangered Species Act listing packages and the assistant manager of um, the species assessment team. John is the project manager for uh, a three bat status assessment, which includes Northern Long-Eared Bats, Tricolor Bats, and Little Brown Bats. Um, so with that, I'll turn it, uh, well, let me, one last slide here. Um, so here's here's the layout for, for today's webinar. Um, we're gonna begin with presentations from Amanda, Juliet, Bethany, and John, and then have a little bit of time for a panel discussion and finish the webinar with questions from the audience. Um, please feel free to uh, type in 
any questions or comments that you have throughout the webinar um, using the chat, and um, we'll try to get to as many as possible. So with that, I will turn it over to Amanda. Amanda, you're on mute. Second time for the day. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Chris, for that introduction. Let me get my screen um, shared here. Okay. Is the slideshow coming through okay? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so what I want to do with the start of our time today is just provide a high uh, level overview of methods to study bat populations to reduce uncertainty about status and trends. And so what we know is that in the United States and Canada, most of the observed wind turbine fatalities have been migratory tree roosting bats. So that's the hoary bat, the silver haired bat, and the eastern red bat shown here. Um, let me see, how do I advance this? Sorry, there we go. What we don't know, however, are the population sizes for these three species of bats. And so the population size would be an account of individuals or the census side, which could be denoted by a, a capital N and a lowercase c. We also don't know population growth rates. And then with the absence of this information, what we don't know is how much wind turbine mortality really must be reduced across North America in order to maintain viable populations of migratory tree roosting bats. So can we just go out and estimate population sizes? Can we use traditional methods that work for other species? And the answer for these three is that probably not. Um, and it really comes down to a variety of characteristics. So these bats are small, they're cryptic, uh, they're solitary. So they're spread out across the landscape for most of the year as bats are nocturnal. Uh, these species are also migratory and so they occupy large geographic ranges. And so there's really no practical way to go out and count them as we can with other species. Um, this slide shows a paper that really brought this, the, this information to light. And so one is there's this recognition that large numbers of these migratory tree bats are being killed, but in the absence of population information, what can we do about it? And so Frick et al. in 2017 published a paper in which they used expert elicitation and population projection models to try to figure out what might the current level of mortality or mortality at, at wind turbines in 2012 anyway, what might that impact be on population viability in the hoary bat? And what their simulation showed is that mortality from wind turbines could drastically reduce hoary bat population size and increase the risk of extinction. And what they concluded in this paper is that if viable populations are to be sustained, then conservation measures really should be implemented and implemented soon. So this paper brought a whole lot of attention to migratory tree bat um, mortality at wind energy facilities. And then a more recent paper published by Friedenberg and Frick in um, 2021 uh, took a continued look at what the expert uh, elicitation suggested for pos possible ranges of population sizes. And then they put that into the context of continued wind energy development. And essentially the conclusion from this paper is that hoary bat population size remains the most important knowledge gap obscuring guidance on overall risk and how much fatality reduction is necessary. And so in the absence of being able to go out and count hoary bats, um, what can we do to inform our knowledge of population status and trends and thereby reduce uncertainty about what these impacts will be? Um, it looks like our best option is going to be to take a weight of evidence approach to gain insights um, into, into these populations. And so really it's taking a holistic uh, approach to get data on bat abundance occupancy uh, from a variety of sources. So some examples would be from rabies for surveillance monitoring where bat carcasses are turned in for rabies testing, uh, for misnet capture counts related to other studies of bat ecology behavior, um, as well as acoustic monitoring and genetic approaches. And so I'm really gonna focus on these last two approaches today and actually the, the panelists are as well. But in 2021, 22, together with uh, my colleagues, Chris Hine and Bethany Straw, we published a paper that really outlined the utility of using acoustic data as well as genetic monitoring to help reduce uncertainty about migratory tree roosting bats. And what we tried to articulate in this article is that we think long-term systematic data collection is the most viable option for reducing this uncertainty. And so Bethany's gonna talk quite a bit about the NABAT protocols um, in just a few minutes, 
but essentially it's a way it's it's this acoustic monitoring framework that uses a systematic grid based uh, framework of 100 kilometer squared cells and probability based sampling. Um, so really it's taking a snapshot across the country and then using acoustic surveys in these in these grid cells, uh, they can be mobile or stationary to get a snapshot of what bats are active in those locations over time. And if you repeatedly sample across years, you can get information then on population status and trends, which she'll talk more about in a few minutes. This figure is really just to show an overlap of the ranges for these three migratory bat species shown in those sort of blue polygons, wind energy deployment shown in yellow, and then acoustic monitoring data available for each species. And so what we can see is we really have the potential here with NA bat to, to get a continental wide perspective on where are hoary bats in relationship to wind um, and how that might be changing over time. Now, what can genetics do uh, to help with this effort? Well, really population genetics as a discipline can answer questions related to uh, population status and trends as well. So we can use these techniques to estimate genetic diversity. Uh, we can use them to identify evolutionarily unique subpopulations, to detect bottlenecks and monitor population declines, and also estimate current and historical effective population size. And so Juliet's gonna be talking more about effective population size and again in a few minutes, but just in a nutshell to kind of set the stage, effective population size is really a parameter that's used in population genetics um, that can tell us the size of an ideal population that would experience the same amount of genetic drift or loss of genetic variation due to chance over time as the observed population. So it's the population that we're interested in. Uh, where it's been studied, uh, effective population size is almost always less than the census population size. And on average, it's about 11, 11% of census population size across animal populations. Unfortunately, though, there's a lot of variability in that ratio. And so we can't just estimate effective population size and know with great precision what that census size is going to be. But it does provide insights into uh, population dynamics and demographics. We know that any is, is influenced by variation of reproductive success, unequal numbers of males and females, as well as fluctuations in population size over time. And if we monitor uh, the genetics of populations over time, what we can look at are, it will, can reveal changes in NE that reflect changes in real population size or that census size. Um, these approaches have already been used successfully in several studies of migratory tree roosting bats to date. Uh, these studies, though, have been based on sort of opportunistic sampling, so not strategic sampling across the range. And the relative size of those boxes give you an indication of the relative effective population size in the eastern red bat compared to the hoary bat and the silver-haired bat. So in the studies that I've listed here, none of them have revealed population structure in any of these bat species. Um, Eastern red bat tend, seems to have the highest diversity and multiple paternity is common in this species. Um, for the hoary bat, it looks like population size might be stable or, or possibly decreasing, but it's not clear. And then silver haired bats just have the smallest effective population size um, overall. So what can we be doing currently in the future with respect to genetics is really moving toward a genomics approach, which again is what Juliet's gonna show when she talks about her data uh, in, this, in this webinar this morning. And really genomics give the advantage of it increases the number of molecular markers, which increases our power and precision of estimates about genetic diversity over time. Um, we really need to be taking more of an expanded geographic coverage. And again, Julia is gonna touch on that with her range-wide studies. And then strategic samplings over, uh, over time can also help us. So if we collect samples in a very strategic way at a 10 year time span interval, we can then monitor that genetic diversity and see if it's declining or not. And one thing that we do know is that as populations decline, genetic diversity tends to decline in predictable ways. So it can be a powerful tool uh, to monitor these populations. This is an example that's not in bats, uh, but it shows a nice illustration of how we can monitor genetic diversity over time, and it coincides with changes in population size. And so this is an example of genetic monitoring of an endangered population of Atlantic salmon from the Dennis River in Maine. Um, the resources for the DNA in this time study were from archival scale and fin uh, tissue clips that were collected at five points in time from 1963 to 2001. So they captured just about a 40 year period. And over these five uh, snapshots in time, 
What these researchers discovered was significant reductions in NE that, in NE that mirrored the reductions in population size, as well as significant reductions in three standard measures of genetic diversity, which are shown down here in these bottom graphs. And so if we can have strategic sampling, we should be able to detect these, these significant declines um, in, in species of interest, whether it's salmon or bats. And so in order to do this, we really need to have an established, organized, coordinated, and cooperative way of collecting these carcasses, tissue samples, storing them, and making them available for research. And I'm happy to say that there has been some progress in recent years um, on this topic. So the next couple of slides that I have are from Todd Katzner at the USGS and just sort of uh, summarize one of the collaborative initiatives to create a carcass repository network to help advance science related to uh, wildlife species that are impacted by renewables, so both solar and wind energy facilities. Um, so it's, it's a partnership with the USGS, Texas Christian University, University of Illinois, um, and many others. But essentially what the vision of this carcass repository network is an interconnected uh, network of facilities that are, are called nodes uh, for the time being. Um, it's a private public partnership that includes industry. Um, and the goal of these facilities is that they will receive, sample, analyze, archive, and ship samples. Um, they're going to be geographically specific. So a facility in the Midwest, for example, would be uh, tasked with collecting carcasses from the Midwest. A uh, facility in Idaho would, be, uh, would collect carcasses from the Mountain West. Um, et cetera, but what they would share is a single searchable database and intellectual approach um, behind the research that can be used to really better understand the, these impacts on populations. In addition to sort of this network of facilities, um, there's an analyst team to evaluate population consequences. A lot of this work is already being done at the USGS and at other um, institutions, uh, but really the idea is to have scientists develop and apply transformative tools to understand impacts to populations, um, and then the focal systems determined uh, by that management need. So the current status of this uh, one carcass repository network um, at a logistical level, there are already nodes established in Idaho, Illinois, and Texas, and there are about 80,000 samples already in hand. Um, at these nodes, you've got freezers, cabinets, computers, and people, and they're currently receiving thousands of wildlife carcasses or, or tissue samples per year. They are not yet interconnected. Um, some initial financial support's in place, but more funding is going to be needed to sustain this long-term. Um, there's already some positive feedback from um, agencies within the Department of Interior. Um, so this is an effort that's going to be uh, continue to be pursued by, by the USGS and others. And then with respect to bats and wind energy, uh, the Illinois Natural History Survey, Survey is a great example of some success we're making in this area. Um, so as of now, uh, 2022, all bats that are collected in uh, monitoring efforts at Illinois wind energy facilities are going to the Illinois Natural History Survey, where they will then be uh, archived within the collections there, and then the carcasses or tissue samples from these carcasses will be available to researchers who want to ask and answer questions um, using those carcasses. So in addition to those from Illinois, INHS has also received thousands of bat carcasses from wind energy facilities in, in Indiana, and this was really facilitated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so in order to have sort of these genetic data available for monitoring, it's taking uh, cooperation and collaboration among a large numbers of agencies and organizations and individuals, uh, but I'm happy to say that progress is being made. And so thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions at the end. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Juliet, uh, you're up next. Okay, just get my screen shared here. Right, PowerPoint coming through. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yep. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for that excellent introduction. Set me up very well to tell you all about my thesis work. Um, as Amanda had uh, said earlier, there were several studies that have been done on these species, uh, but they've all only used one or two sites. So there was one study that used bats from Texas and Minnesota. Uh, there were a couple studies that used bats from a single wind farm in Ohio, a study that used bats from the Appalachian region, uh, but all in these very specific locations. And several of the earlier studies used microsatellites, so only a handful of genetic markers. Um, and today, some of the later studies can use a genomics methods, 
which I'll be telling you more about in a bit. Um, unfortunately, all these different studies use gen different genetic markers, so we can't actually combine the results from them. Uh, thus, we currently had an incomplete knowledge of range-wide structure, which led me to my thesis. And here I'm telling you about the first chapter uh, using genomics and in particular uh, genotyping by sequencing with range-wide sampling to estimate effective population size and population structure in hoary bats, eastern red bats, and silver-haired bats. So what is genomics? Uh, genomics is actually a section of genetics, so it, it uses the complete genetic information of an organism, um, uses sequencing and bioinformatics to uh, estimate uh, things like population structure and genetic diversity. So very simply, we look at the differences in genes and we can estimate where that uh, gene flow is, if there's lots of gene flow across the population structure, or is it very distinct uh, subpopulations? And then we measure the genetic diversity, and the genetic diversity is actually what uh, we can use to calculate effective population size. So as Amanda pointed out, effective population size is not census size. It's usually a, a fraction of that, um, but it can be used to give us insights into what's going on in these species. So I used a method called genotyping by sequencing to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And SNPs are actually just uh, places on the DNA where a single nucleotide is different. So I start with the whole uh, genome of a bat, uh, extract the DNA from tissue, and use an enzyme. I use PST1, and that cuts it at specific locations on that genome. And then I take that DNA, the pieces of DNA, and I put a unique barcode on each piece so that each individual bat has a specific barcode attached to its DNA. And then I can take all the, the DNA pieces and pool them together. So you see this, this uh, little droplet of clear liquid here actually has DNA from 48 different bats, all with unique barcodes. And then I ship that off to, I used a, the lab in Berkeley to, to sequence that. And I get back a big text file of A, C, T's, and G's of all the, the sequenced DNA. Uh, from there, you use bioinformatics to identify all those spots on the DNA where one nucleotide is different. And with that, we can calculate things like the population structure and effective population size. Uh, so I am um, presenting here my results of the principal component analyses uh, for the population structure. And for any estimation, I'll be telling you about my coalescent modeling of the historical NE. Uh, just a, a quick side note here, because I think it's very important. Uh, Amanda gave you a very good overview of what effective population size actually is. And she did mention there are these two different kinds, historical and current. Um, they're, they're calculated very differently, and you need to interpret them very differently. So a historical NE uh, incorporates thousands of generations. Um, it's much easier to do with large populations. And uh, the, what I used is coalescent modeling. Uh, this should not be compared with current census size because it covers such a, a wide range in the species past. Um, it can be still useful. There was a really cool example uh, that actually used historical NE to estimate whale populations in pre-whaling times. So while it can be useful, it's actually not what we want to use if what we're interested in is in the current bat populations. So current uh, NE just includes the last several generations. Um, unfortunately, this is a method that is difficult to use with large populations. So it's pretty effective if you're looking at very small populations, say a couple dozen um, isolated individuals. Uh, when you get into these large populations of bats, um, you often end up with confidence intervals that include infinity. And this, all, a lot of those papers that Amanda uh, mentioned uh, came across this issue. Um, linkage to equilibrium is the most uh, commonly used method. Um, but again, uh, also, I want to point out, so if your confidence interval includes infinity, that does not mean it's a very large population. What that means is the method is failing to constrain that estimate with precision. So, for example, uh, in a lot of my estimates with the current NE, I was getting ranges of somewhere between 1,000 and infinity. And yeah, that's probably true. There are somewhere between 1,000 bats and infinity bats. Um, but we can certainly say they're not an infinite number of bats in the landscape. So just be aware um, of the pitfalls in these, these estimates. If you're talking about effective population size, know which type it is um, and be aware of those confidence intervals. So back to my thesis. Um, I collected samples from across these horrid, horrid bat 
Silverhead and Eastern Ranges with the help of many, many, many people. I had dozens of people, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, a lot of different private consultation companies that were out there on the ground collecting these bats. Um, so I'm from museums, other universities. I uh, could not have done this without these people's helps. And um, hearing Amanda talk about the, the repository coming up is very exciting from the, uh, as, as just a place that these samples can be, can be stored and future work uh, won't have to talk to each individual person. So with, a, with this uh, range-wide work, uh, what did I find? With the hoary bats, uh, there was no genetic structure. So a hoary bat in California genetically looked like a hoary bat in New York. Um, the historical NE was around 100,000, which is a little bit smaller than other uh, studies have found, but I used different methods, so that's not necessarily surprising. Uh, same with the eastern red bats, as previous studies with the microsats showed, these species had no genetic structure, uh, so that meant, you know, penmictic species, lots of, lots of uh, gene flow among them. And again, the historical NE was actually larger for eastern red bats, following what other studies have found as well. And uh, the, the cool results, uh, silver-haired bats, when I looked range-wide, actually have uh, longitudinal genetic structure. So bats in the west are different genetically from bats in the east. Um, unfortunately, you'll notice there's this big gap in the middle of the continent where I was not able to find summering bat samples. Um, the, there were bats killed at, at wind turbines a lot of times, but it was in fall, and I, I specifically wanted the summering samples to look for my research. Um, but this is pretty neat, just a, a showing that it, it is worth looking range-wide. And again, the historical need for the species was much smaller than the other two. Uh, so conversation or conservation implications, uh, hoary bats and eastern red bats are panbicnic, meaning there's a lot of gene flow in the species. So if you have a region of high mortality, it could act as a population sink, negatively impacting the population as a whole. Uh, the silver, silver haired bats have this longitudinal population structure, so it's it, uh, worth looking at them and conserving them, managing them with an eastern population and a western population. Um, it would be good to try to fill in that middle of the continent to see exactly where that uh, the, the differences uh, are. And because they have this, this local, this structure, they might be more vulnerable to local population declines and losing some of their genetic diversity. Um, I think that is all I have. Great, thank you, Juliet. Uh, Bethany, you're up next. All right, minimize. We can see your slides. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Bethany Strauss. Chris introduced. I'm a biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Fort Collins Science Center and serve as the assistant coordinator of the North American Bat Monitoring Program. Happy Bat Week, um, and happy to be able to share some of what's coming out of NA Bat and the Status and Trends products that uh, we're serving up. Um, as a quick note, there is a ton of content to cover on what's gone into these analyses and what's coming out of them, but with the limited time, I'm going to be providing a high-level view, um, and if you want more detail on statistics or some of uh, the nuance here that we won't have time to cover, please reach out to me and, and happy to get, get you that information. I want to first just note that the work I'm presenting today is the result of the very hard um, and dedicated efforts of many people, including uh, several dozens of people beyond those that are pictured on this screen. But um, our core analytical team that works both on the statistical R&D, um, as well as running the actual models and doing the analyses that I'm gonna be providing an overview today, that includes the folks that are here, um, Wayne Thog, Martin, Brian Reichert, Kathy Urban, Ashton Weens, Brad Udell, and Christian Stratton are all work with the U.S. Geological Survey um, and represent three different science centers within the survey, and Tina Chang um, from Bat Conservation International. For those that may be less aware um, or less familiar with NABAT um, or might know, but there's a lot of common misconceptions about the program. Um, just wanted to note uh, what, what our program does and aims to do. So NABAT is a population monitoring program um, that is international in scope. 
um, and, North, and focused on North American bat populations. And NA bat aims to increase the quantity and quality of data on North American bats, make these data discoverable or truly accessible so they um, can be uh, accessed to address bat conservation problems and management needs and use these data to provide regular updates on status and trends of North American bats. A quick note on um, why regular updates, um, there's, uh, when we produce an analysis that we're providing a snapshot in time or a limited window that is bounded by our data um, and the temporal scope of those data. And so if we stop producing those analyses as the data set uh, is updated, then we can't see how populations might be changing outside of that tempor initial temporal scope. Um, so as uh, many of us are already aware, bats are extremely difficult to monitor and study and there are several information gaps um, despite about 100 years of monitoring bats in North America, there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, and all of these challenges were documented in this 20, uh, 2003 report that's, that's here on the right and um, which also documents what's our best bet for, for closing these information gaps about North American bats. Um, and in many ways, this served as a key foundational piece for how NA bat was developed, how it's structured and what we do. Um, but some of the information gaps that we still grapple with are stereotypical movement patterns, where every roost and hibernaculum is, population sizes for many species, um, migration patterns and routes. So not only where are they in a particular season, but where do they go and how? Um, what are the, what's the typical migration distance from, a, let's say, home range? Um, why do bats approach, approach turbines? And what is the true species range uh, for these species? So we use an, a weight of evidence approach. Um, Amanda used that terminology earlier. Um, because bats are so hard to study and we have so many information gaps, essentially we're trying to access everything that we can, all of the data streams that are um, available and pull those together to uh, produce information on status and trends. And so what do I, first of all, what are those data types? Um, a lot of, one of the common misconceptions is that NABAT is an acoustic monitoring program. And um, that is an incomplete picture of what we do. We use, um, we do use acoustic data um, because it allows us to probabilistically sample across a broad landscape. Um, and that includes manually ID'd or manually vetted um, or labeled um, acoustic data and auto ID'd acoustic data from most mobile acoustic transects and stationary surveys. Um, we use capture data as well, external colony counts or emergence counts and internal counts from both winter and summer. Um, there are protocols that have been developed for some of these types uh, to follow uh, and uh, to create a uniform sampling plan um, and uh, follow a master sample or a probabilistic sample. We do pull in into our database data, whether, no matter how, or we accept data, no matter how it was collected. So whether you follow the NABAT protocol or not, those data can still be aggregated into the database and used uh, for these or other analyses. Um, so what do I mean by population status and trends? These are measures of summer abundance, um, summer occupancy. So summer abundance being um, where bats are across the landscape and in what number and how is that changing over time? Summer occupancy is where do these bats occur or what is their, um, uh, in simple words, where are they more likely to occur or be, and um, where are they less likely to occur, and how is that changing over time? And then winter abundance, which is uh, primarily from counts or is from winter counts from um, hibernacula, and how are those cha uh, counts changing for individual sites and across the monitored uh, population range? The three of these come together to give us a more complete picture of population status and trends. The reason why we need to use these three is one, for migratory bats, we don't have hybrid, they're not aggregating at winter sites. So we don't have those counts that we can rely on um, and we need other sources of information. Um, and for certain species, they're easier to monitor or some data types work better than others. 
Um, but also these metrics offer different sensitivity um, in terms of how quickly we might observe changes in a population from the results of these analyses. Most notably, abundance is more sensitive to changes in a population where we're going to observe those changes much quicker and much easier than we are going to from occupancy um, because um, for occupancy, we're not looking at how, you, you can still have a high um, estimate for occupancy even if there's only one bat. So the numbers of those bats could be changing while occupancy um, may be changing um, either slower or, or uh, harder to observe. Um, you can find more information about this and uh, access products through the URL at the bottom, um, nabatmonitoring.org forward slash status and trends. So the data that power these analyses, I mentioned the different data types, um, but we've aggregated over 72 million total records in our database. Um, and this includes colony counts, capture records, and mobile and stationary acoustic data. The largest proportion of these data, as you can see here on the screen, is from stationary acoustics, um, which is wonderful to see these aggregated and make, made accessible. Um, but we are also working to in, uh, aggregate and increase the number of these other types of counts and also encourage monitoring or a diversified monitoring approach for different species because um, the, as I mentioned earlier, some data types work better, but also in the West, for example, we don't have, even for cave roosting or, or hibernating bats, we don't have sites in the West that we can rely on for those counts. So if we want to kind of expand our knowledge there, we need a diversified approach and, and really leaning on additional data types um, to give us that more complete picture. These data have been contributed by hundreds of different partners who are doing bat monitoring across the continent of all types and colors, some of which include the NA bat monitoring protocol and some of which do not. Um, and they have submitted their data to our um, database through the NA bat partner portal. And you can just see that proportion of where these data are coming from by organization here. Um, the, a large uh, majority of our partners, um, or I'm sorry, um, some of our highest contributing partners include state and federal agencies, but we also have uh, really high engagement from tribes, um, NGOs, and some, um, some other organizations like consulting firms. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about what we mean by summer occupancy and what's coming out of this analysis. So for summer occupancy, or at least the analysis that was published at, um, earlier this year, we used mobile acoustic, stationary acoustic, and capture records to um, feed into this summer occupancy analysis. And that is estimating or um, making predictions about where bats occur across the landscape in summer and how this is changing over time being how this is at annual time steps. Um, we, so for 12 species, we estimated the probability of occupancy for sampled and unsampled areas and changes in occupancy over time. So put simply, the way the modeling framework works is it's taking the, the, the knowledge that we have across all sites and pulling that together, taking that power um, of what we know or can learn about relationships to different environmental variables or covariates, um, and then taking that and applying it to an unsampled location to make an estimate or a prediction. Um, and this is because it's simply un infeasible to sample everywhere. Um, and so we are um, leveraging that, that robust data set, those 72 million records um, to help inform or provide insight um, even where we're not sampling. Um, we documented this work and all of the detailed results um, in a 300 page report, which is uh, published and, and totally publicly available. We did go through a peer review process that follows the USGS um, guidelines for, for publishing. There's also a manuscript that's currently in prep that's a follow-up to this effort. It's using the same data set um, I'm sorry, an updated data set. Um, uh, so notably there's more captured records, but also some additional data that have um, been contributed. Um, and, but the modeling approach, the scripts are exactly the same, but we're also adding in and exploring this option for how we can use expert elicitation to supplement data-driven results. Um, and so that manuscript is forthcoming. We also provide a data release of the results. So the actual model outputs are publicly available and accessible. You can download those. 
and um, look at them as well as the R script um, for the model. Um, and then we've also got high resolution maps. I'll talk you through a little bit of what these look like. Um, I know there's a lot going on here, but this is um, just intended to be a sample of what does it mean when we're providing status and trends products and what are the, what's the information that you can access. So I mentioned that 300 page report, ton of information in there um, that you, and you can navigate to uh, the topic or information of interest. Um, but we also have some high level results that's available on the NABAP partner portal. If you, you, can, you can get to that summary table by going to nabapmonitoring.org and in the top right, there's a button that says partner portal. And if you click that, it'll take you to a landing page that includes um, the, this summary table, which currently just has the, the occupancy results um, that were published this year. And you can navigate to a lot of information. And so, um, it gives you estimates of uh, total change in this table at three different um, windows of time. So a shorter time window from 2016 to 2019, then a little bit longer, 2012 to 2019, and then 2010 to 2019 to give you that kind of what's recently happened and then what's that expanded view. If you click on those, it'll pop up a graph that's gonna show you um, what a plot, what those annual estimates in occupancy or those occupancy probabilities were. And you can see how that was changing over time. And it's, it's colored so that you can see um, how that relates to the amount of, um, of actual data. Uh, um, yeah, and so uh, you, there's also high resolution maps that you can access uh, two that are most notable. One, which uh, this is a little brown that, um, uh, most recent estimated or predicted occupancy across what we call the modeled species range or, um, yeah, I'm sorry, modeled species range. And the reason we say modeled species range is because one, we don't know what the true species range is, um, but we are limiting our predictions to where data actually support them. And so you'll see here this blue line. Um, this is the published species, species range, um, but there is white space here. Um, that's because we did not have data to power those predictions, so we limited where we made those predictions. Um, but there's also areas outside of the that reference range where we make predictions, and that's simply because we have data to support to support that. Um, there's also a change map that's showing you, how, you know, where where are we seeing higher and lower change, and how is that changing over space, um, or how does that differ over space? State level results, so you can drill down into individual states. Um, we also have an interactive dashboard where you can actually click on an individual 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell and see the prediction for that grid cell. And then you can look at that, the, our, these results at multiple scales. So the finest resolution being an individual grid cell, you can scale that up to an area of interest with a lasso or look at state level results all the way up to a region or the modeled species range. And again, as I mentioned before, um, all of the results are, are available and accessible through a USGS data release. Going on to summer abundance, um, we are in the current analysis that's underway, but has not been um, uh, finished for all six species and still needs to be peer reviewed. We use mobile acoustic data alone, both manually vetted and auto ID'd. In the future, we would like to use summer colony counts, but we didn't have a sufficient um, data to include in this round, but plan to in the future. So what these summer abundance analyses are telling us is what are the number of bats occupying some important summer roosts or surrounding habitats each year and how are these numbers changing over time. We had sufficient data to model six species and we estimated abundance for sampled and unsampled areas and changes in abundance over time. The products that are going to be coming out of this are going to be very similar or parallel um, to the occupancy results or the occupancy products that I talked through, but it'll be for an abundance metric as opposed to an occup occupancy metric. I want to quickly note that um, we have we've preliminary results for three of these six species and for three species um, still underway. Um, so here are some examples, figures. This has not been peer reviewed. These are not final results. These are preliminary and not for citation or distribution. In other words, this can change. Um, but these are just some example figures that you might be able to see and access from uh, the summer abundance analysis, including relationships to covariates, um, like 
building density, average temperature, max elevation, percent forest, physiographic diversity. But you'll also see these um, maps that uh, plot or um, show spatially these predictions and how that's changing over space and then kind of in a tiled format so you can see um, uh, how those predictions are changing over time. Um, this is in this, this C plot down here, this is a change map. So you can see kind of a heat map of where we're seeing relatively more or less change and on overlaid is uh, white nose syndrome spread. And then um, this also plotted in a graph over time. For the winter abundance analysis, we analyzed data for 10 species, estimated change in abundance at sampled sites, and then change in abundance at the monitored species range level. Um, so again, we don't know where every single hibernaculum is. And even if we did, there isn't capacity to sample all of those every single year. Um, so we're um, just clarifying that um, this is not, a, uh, this is a representation of what we think is happening based on where we sample. Um, the products that are forthcoming is going to be a manuscript, which is uh, currently in prep, a long detailed report and the data release of results. And as I mentioned earlier, these analyses these are powered by internal uh, colony counts in winter. Um, so this is again preliminary information um, that is subject to re revision, not for citation or distribution. These are just illustrative. They're examples of some of the information that you might be able to access through the products I just mentioned, including um, summary statistics of the data that were included in across which species. A map of monitored sites uh, color coded by white nose syndrome arrival. Um, the effect of uh, population on population growth rates uh, since white nose syndrome has arrived. And then these plots, um, the, the grouping of nine includes, there was three different um, model approaches that were included, which we don't have time to dig into today, but it's showing the results from observed colony count, or sorry, the observed colony counts, which are the black dots, the um, exponential interpolation predictions. So that's where you're trying to connect where we um, don't have periods that were sampled and Bayesian hierarchical model predictions with confidence intervals represented with those dotted lines. Um, again, this is also preliminary information, except for the summer occupancy, which has been peer reviewed and published. Um, but this is a summary table of the status and trends results that are either have been published or are currently underway. Um, this is high level and not representative of everything. For example, for summer occupancy that you'll see that this is just the shortest time window. It's not showing all of those time windows. Um, and uh, showing those that are in, still in process. Um, we have focused on white nose syndrome impacted species, but have included wind energy impacted species in these analysis because we know there's a, a massive need for that information, but because of the origins of the program, NABAT initially has been predominantly focused on white nose syndrome impacted species and trying to quantify what's happening with these populations. Just to very briefly explain what you're seeing on the screen here, um, if the color is red, that means that the estimates or model predictions are saying that the species is declining and confidence intervals do not overlap zero. If it's blue, it means that the estimates or predictions are showing that they are increasing and um, estimates do not overlap zero. And if it is black, our confidence intervals do overlap zero. Okay, so finally, this is the, my last slide. These are just some questions that I wanted the audience to actually consider um, about what NABAT can support and how we can help close information gaps for bats um, broadly, even beyond population status and trends. Considering with the breadth and volume of data in the NABAT database, there's additional information that could be delivered. Um, and so posing the question to you all and would love to hear whether it be today or, or through follow-up, what would you find valuable and what questions would you hope to see NABAT help and answer? Um, with that, I thank you for your time and happy bat week. Thanks, Bethany. Um, and we'll move on to our last speaker, John. Hello, everyone. Now that I practice sharing my screen a bunch of times, it won't work, I'm sure. How do we look? We see the title slide, Chris? Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, um, 
That was great. I appreciate all my colleagues. I'm going to pivot here a little bit in the sense that um, I am totally not worthy to be on this panel with this group. These are very smart uh, modeling and analytical folks, as well as bat experts, and I am neither one of those two things. So I want to set expectations very early on. Um, I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I am a project manager, as Chris said, um, but I do not have a background in that. So I want to make that clear right away. I'm more of a policy and project management expert. So I work with lots of different species uh, as a project manager on our species assessment team. Um, and I have learned a lot about bats over the last couple of years, but it is not what my uh, formal training is in. Um, so, and, and the other way we're kind of going to pivot here is uh, I wanted to give folks uh, an update on kind of how the, what we refer to internally as the three bat species status assessment got started where the status of all the three bats in that SSA are today and where we're gonna be going in the future in terms of specifically to the Endangered Species Act and the, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so to carry on in that direction, um, all this, sorry, screen messed up here. All this uh, started with a very small in-person meeting, if you can believe that, in Minneapolis in February of 2020. So that all happened right before COVID shutdown started. And so that was my last in-person meeting for a couple of years, and I won't be forgetting that one anytime soon. Um, and to give folks an impetus about kind of why we started this process for each one of these species, I thought I'd share that driving force behind the SSA for each species. So what went into the initiation of the three bat species status assessment that covers the northern long ear bat. The tricolor bat and uh, the little brown bat is what's kind of generally described on the, on the screen before you. And of course, the northern long ear bat has a much longer history, but the most current version and reason for why it's being worked on is because we have this court order that um, orders us to make a, a new final determination for the species by November 30th, 2022. So um, as many of you probably know, we did list the species in with a, a, a threatened with a 4D rule um, back in 2015 and 2016. And that rule is still in place because as part of this court order, the judge remanded the rule back to us. So he said we had to do it over, but he did not vacate it. So he left that rule in place. And we'll go into that a little further later on as well. Um, and the tricolor bat, we were actually petitioned to list the species back in 2016. So that's why we are working on it now as, a, as an answer to that petition. And then lastly, the little brown bat is actually a Fish and Wildlife Service initiated discretionary review. So there are two different ways a species can get listed under the Endangered Species Act. One is if we are petitioned by the public, which is far and away the most common way we list species. And then the other way is if um, we're aware of some information that makes us want to take a closer look at it, we can go through sort of the same process to determine whether or not the species warrants listing. And we can take that on ourselves. And that's what we did for the little brown bat. We were not petitioned. That was something the service decided to take on itself. Um, so all these species, all three of these species were placed on our national listing work plan, um, which is a public work plan that we share on our website to try to give folks an idea of what's coming up and what we're working on. Uh, and they were all to be completed around the same time. Uh, they have, you know, a lot of overlapping species biology. Their, their primary threat is white nose syndrome for all three of them. Uh, and we figured uh, it, for efficiency's sake, we would complete a single species status assessment for all three species. So that's what we did. Um, and just to give a, a very small amount of background about what a species status assessment is, for those who might not know, um, the SSA framework is an analytical approach that was developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to deliver foundational science for informing um, all ESA decisions. So I gave you that citation to the SSA framework at the bottom there, but if you really are interested in more information than what I'm going to cover on this slide, which is really just the tip of the iceberg, um, you could easily find our framework by just Googling um, species status assessment. You can find the framework. Uh, it's publicly available as well. But um, the general high-level cliche, 30,000-foot level gist of, of what we do is we um, collect all of the information that we can. So we send out like dear just a party letters and try to get cast as wide of a net as possible to get all relevant information for um, these different ESA decision make decision decisions that we need to make. 
And we go through this kind of three-step process that's outlined on the left. So using that information that we received from all of our partners, we um, categorize the species needs, uh, and then we look at whether currently those species needs are available and what condition those needs are in. And we describe the current condition of the species using that information. So incorporated into that is, is the threats to the species, as well as conservation actions that um, are, are being done that would help the species and, and help also lead to its current condition. And then as well as talking about the current availability of condition of those needs, we also look at the future availability or condition of those needs, and we project a future species condition. And, and oftentimes, you know, we try to uh, bracket that future the best we can. So a lot of times if, if folks have read um, species status assessment reports written by the Fish and Wildlife Service, we'll often have multiple future scenarios based on different probable uh, futures that we we find uh, from the available information. And then the diagram on the right is just uh, a visual breakdown of what we use these SSA reports for. So the analysis itself is summarized into a report, and then we use that as our foundational science for listing and delisting decisions, um, critical habitat recovery planning, and of course, section 10 and 7 as well. And uh, I will say that this does not, this, this doesn't, we're not locked into the SSA report. If we receive or, or come across additional information that was not um, incorporated into that SSA report uh, right before a, a decision is to be finalized, we can update that SSA report or also con just consider that information along with the SSA report if it's um, relevant to whatever sort of ESA decision we're making. And those SSA and SSA reports are meant to be living analyses and um, reports so that we can, we, we share them um, publicly, but we are, we are able to update them as we get new information, update our analysis as well as the report. So um, for the three bat species status assessment, um, we, we analyzed the northern long bat, the tricolor, and the little brown bat, of course, and we, we did one analysis, meaning that we had one analytical approach that we used for all three of the bats. But we did this for ease of use in terms of moving forward and updating. We did use, write three different reports um, and two of those finalized reports, and I should have put quotes around finalized because as I said, they can always be updated. But the reports for the Northern long ear bat and the tricolor bat are currently publicly available. Uh, and the little brown bat report will become available once um, we publish a 12 month finding for the little brown bat. And I'll get to that more in a minute as well. Um, and so the whole point of these assessments, again, is to support, uh, for the, I'm sorry, for the three bat assessment was to support um, Endangered Species Act listing determinations. So I will quickly walk through the current status for each of the, the, the three species uh, to, to make that perfectly clear. I know there there's occasionally some um, misunderstandings about what a proposed species means to, to, the, to the rest of the world until we finalize. And, and of course, for each of these three species, it's slightly different. Northern long-eared bat being the most kind of convoluted, um, it does at this time, the protections of the threatened status along with the 4D rule remains in effect at this time uh, until we finalize a rule. So even though this species was proposed as endangered in March 23rd, 2022, uh, the, the threatened rule was left in place by the judge. So that rule supersedes the proposed rule. So we're still following all the, the final rule for the Northern long ear bat, which was threatened with a fine D, 4D rule remains in effect until we finalize a rule November 30th, 2022. Um, and that, Rule finalization does not necessarily mean that the species will be endangered. It's proposed as endangered. We had a public comment period and received a lot of information. And, uh, you know, that we incorporate that, that information into our analysis and uh, we have to make a final determination by November. It does not mean that just because it's been proposed as endangered, it will be finalized as endangered. And as a matter of fact, we proposed the Northern long bat as endangered uh, in 2004. 14 and finalized as threatened. So I just want to put out there that's, um, that you know, it is a proposal at this time and the threatened species status remains in place until we finalize that rule. For the tricolor bat, it's proposed as endangered as well. 
Um, and there is obviously no previous rule that we're following. So for the vast majority of the world, nothing really changes at this time with the exception of other federal agencies. Other federal agencies do need to confer with the US Fish and Wildlife Service in order to make sure that their, um, their any action that overlaps with the ranges of the tricolored bat does not jeopardize the species. Um, and that the other thing I wanted to say about that is if folks do want to, um, to work on an HCP with other listed bat species, they can incorporate the tricolor bat into that HCP if they so choose to do so. Uh, and with that uh, status of proposed endangered, we are currently in a open public comment period for the, that proposed rule uh, that ends November 14th, 2022. Uh, and you can submit comments if you're interested or information uh, at www.regulations.gov just by searching for a tricolor bat and then clicking on proposed rule on that website. Um, and also, we also had a, a, a uh, some of you may have been on that, we had a, a, a public hearing and a public meeting already for that species during this open comment period. And so I just wanted to mention that as well. So that was just basically another webinar similar to this, but it had that public hearing piece of it that is attached where people are allowed to actually submit their formal comments um, via, via um, a webinar rather than, than in writing. And so those will be incorporated into the public comment period. So again, until November 24th, that public comment period remains open. So I encourage anyone who is interested in submitting comments. And finally, the little brown bat, um, currently there is no ESA status for this one. We are, the discretionary review is, is still ongoing. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, these three bats are in the national listing work plan and the, we are uh, shooting to make a 12 month finding for the little brown bat in fiscal year 2023. And what a 12 month finding is, that's some good government and ESA jargon there. That means that we, we'll be making a determination on whether or not the species meets the definition of endangered or threatened, uh, or whether it does not warrant listing. So if we find that the species does meet that definition of threatened or endangered, we would then propose a rule at that same time and open a public comment period. If we find that the species does not warrant listing, we that's a final agency action. We would publish a 12 month not warranted finding and, and that would be um, the end of that status review and, and we could always be petitioned on it again later or but that is there is no proposed rule for a, a 12 month not warranted finding. And so that's kind of where we are now and the next steps moving forward for each species. Uh, the northern long ear bat, as I mentioned previously, we have that court order to publish a final determination. Uh, by November 30th, 2022. And I wanted to point out there that if we end up with an endangered species status, then the full protections of ESA would then go into place. So the 4D rule would then be nullified by a finalization of an endangered species status. The species specific or, or special 4D rules that, that are a part of the Endangered Species Act are only available to the service for a threatened species. So any species that is listed as endangered just re receives the full suite of protections from the Endangered Species Act. Uh, for tricolor bat, we have a statutory deadline to finalize a determination with one year within one year of a proposed rule, and that published on September. That's incorrect. Apologies. That's that's the deadline to publish a final determination is September fourteenth, two thousand twenty three. So we. We published our proposed rule on, on 2022 of this year, and that's why the open comment period is now. And uh, again, I'll just say it out loud since I made a mistake. The deadline for finalizing is September 14th, 2023, for the tricolored bat. Uh, and then again, uh, I mentioned this already, but the little brown bat is scheduled to be completed, uh, the 12 month finding in fiscal year 2023. Um, and whatever date that ends up being, if we find that uh, the species does meet the definition of threatened or endangered, we would have that same one year statutory time frame to complete any final rule. And of course, we would then also open a 60 day public comment period for any proposed rule for that species as well. 
Um, and again, if we do find that the species does not warrant listing, that is a final agency action and there would be no comment period nor a um, final rule. It would just be not warranted and, and that would end the process at that point. So that is all I had. Um, looking forward to any questions or clarifying comments that we might get from folks. Um, yeah, that's all I had for you to update on the kind of ESA policy part of these three bats. Great, thanks, John. And thanks again to Amanda, Juliet, and Bethany. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of um, notes. Um, several links were uh, included in the chat. Um, Bethany put in a couple related to any bat and Lori Pruitt added a couple of links with respect to the um, SSAs for Northern long-eared bat and the tricolored bat. Um, so we have about 20 or so minutes for, for Q&A. So uh, please feel free to um, uh, type your questions into the chat and, and we'll get to those. Um, and as people are thinking about those, um, I have a couple of questions for our uh, speakers. Um, hey, hey, Chris, I was just yeah. going to say one more tiny thing, too. I don't know if you're planning on sharing slides, but you can have mine if, if anybody wants them, if anybody's interested in them. Okay, I uh, appreciate that. Um, uh, and for, for, for those who maybe joined a little bit late, the, the webinar recording will be on uh, TFIS um, shortly after uh, we conclude, so um, maybe by the end of the day or uh, latest tomorrow. Um, oh, and Haley put in the link for, for where the webinar recording will be on TFIS there for you. Um, so um, one question, I'll, I'll start with Amanda and, and others, please feel free to chime in. But so this, this webinar is, was primarily aimed for those involved in the wind energy and, and wildlife community. Um, and so just wanted to ask, you know, what can wind and wildlife stakeholders do to help support um, this uncertainty we have around um, population uh, size, uh, status, trends, et cetera. So, I mean, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think the best thing would be, would be a, a willingness to share data and to make it accessible to researchers so that we could really get an idea of where are these bats? When are these bats in certain locations? Um, to try to get a complete picture um, of how they're using space over time would be great. Um, other, any other thoughts? I would second what Amanda said and that this can be, it can, that can look a lot of different ways, but there is a tremendous amount of effort that's being put um, from the wind industry to collect data and a lot of information on bats. Um, and there's an opportunity to augment the value of those data by aggregating them and um, in a complementary way with other data sets. Um, so we can draw inference, increase power, but also just get an expanded picture in terms of, um, you know, temporal and spatial scope. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, um, sometimes there's a concern about providing data that's linked to a site. Um, so maybe Amanda for genetic data going into these nodes that you mentioned, mm -hmm. Bethany data going into NA bat. Um, is it critical to have that site specific information? It's not critical, but it certainly is helpful, right? So if we just know what's on the planet, <laughs> that doesn't really help us with these temporal trends. Uh, but certainly the data could be fuzzed for a lack of a better word. So maybe it could be at the level of the county. If there are, say, multiple renewable energy facilities within a county and one owner operator doesn't want to stand out from that pack, or it could be over a multi-county state level, and probably even at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service region level would still be useful spatial data that if aggregated could go uh, be compiled with other data that could still provide useful information. So certainly with these repositories, there's a there would be a way to anonymize data. And I hope that that wouldn't keep individuals or, or organizations from being willing to contribute. We could come up with a solution um, to satisfy those needs. 
So the for NABAT, the way that we talk about this or think about this is that the finer resolution that the data are provided, the more we can do with it and the more that we can learn. Um, so if we re reduce the resolution in any way, we're giving up data like and so we're giving up information and what we how we can analyze those data so that it offers the greatest value if we have a point location however that does not meet our minimum requirements for how you provide data and i want to also say this is not a concern that's unique to the wind industry all kinds of partners have concerns about providing location specific information and for a myriad of reasons um, and so the way we address that is we say, okay, we need, we need some location information, specific uh, information, and that can be our 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. Um, and we, we don't accept stuff or don't want to go down the road of county for that. That was an example that Amanda used because it's not uniform. Um, and so you can have, especially in places like Texas, you can have a county that's like as big as Delaware. <laughs> like it's, and so we want it to be um, comparable. And so we ask that folks provide it to the grid cell location. Um, there are some instances where there is actually a legal barrier into where the grid cell, like we've been talking with the state of Texas, um, Texan Parks and, Texas Parks and Wildlife, where um, there's actually state law that prohibits them or where that's actually a sticky situation for the state to be able to prov offer data um, at that sell due to private land ownership concerns. So we are exploring, okay, what's that uniform grid cell size because our grid cell, our, our master sample and grid frame is, is scalable. You can go down and you can go up. And so for Texas, we're exploring this option of we may need to go up because we don't want it to be this all or nothing. Um, and so we'll lose a little bit of, of that value by having less resolution, but still be able to access those data. So we're trying to find what that Goldilocks resolution is and what that looks like and, and hopefully implement that. Um, I also wanna add to this is that for NABAT, we are not, we are not focused on any one particular site. Like we're not honing in on what's happening at just this one site, which I think is kind of a, a fear that somebody could put the magnifying glass at one site and perhaps misinterpret and then publish something that could be misleading or misinformed. And that is not our, all our, at all our objective. Our objective, and I think the good science that we're trying to do is pull together the wealth of information across sites to learn as much as we can about what's happening with populations, what are their relationships, um, or what are the relationships to spatial and environmental covariates? How is that changing across space so we can produce these reliable estimates, um, but also use that information to improve our models, for example? Um, I, could, I could keep going. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Those are the options we have. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Juliet, uh, you mentioned that previous studies were kind of constrained by the geography where they collected data and that you were able to do, you know, pretty much a continent wide um, study. Um, what are the biggest challenges to, to doing that? Um, uh, you know, completing a range wide genetic study on bats? I think the biggest challenge is simply getting access to samples from such a big region. Um, it was a lot of emailing, a lot of coordinating with people. Um, and, 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 we, and we pulled it off. I know a lot of the people I got samples from are actually on this call, so thank you so much. Um, but if, if we can uh, put together this repository, uh, that would allow so much more research to be done in the future. Great. Um, and, and Julia, um, you're still working on your, your dissertation? Or are you getting I closed? actually am defending next week. <laughs> oh, well, congrats. That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so your dissertation will be out um, shortly then. That's, that's yes, it will be. Um, John, what um, what is what is now required um, that uh, several of these or a couple of these species have, have been proposed as endangered? Yeah, and I think I, I did try to touch on that, but it would be good to, to bring it up again because it's weird because all three of the different species are have convoluted different statuses and histories. So northern long-eared bat, 
nothing is it's proposed endangered. Nothing is required beyond what was already required as a threatened with a 4D. So that rule is still in place and people still should be following uh, everything that goes along with that rule until we make a final determination um, on November 30th, 2022. 20, That's what year we're in, right? Um, so that one is kind of, it's still, you know, status quo as it has been since the rule was finalized as threatened with a 4D rule. Um, tricolor bat for the vast majority of folks, does, nothing has changed. We have a proposed rule out there that we're seeking comments on. We're working towards finalizing. Uh, and, and the only folks that, that that changes anything for is anyone with any federal agency with a, a project that they're working on that overlaps in that range may have to confer with the Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure not that, can, that they're not going to jeopardize the species. Um, and again, Folks can, if they choose, so choose as a proposed endangered, they can incorporate tricolored bat into any HCP that they have or might be working on uh, with other listed species, but that's that's not a requirement. That's just an option. Uh, and then for little brown bat, nothing, you know, there's no proposal of any kind, so nothing has changed at this point. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions that have come into the chat. Um, and John, just staying with you, uh, we've got a question about um, some of this work that you you were discussing. Was the court ordered deadline for the northern longer bat a response to the five year review? What is the difference between a five year review and uh, SSA? And they're just trying to fit some of these pieces together. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I know how. I mean. I'm in the government now for over 10 years and I still struggle with all of our terms. So I'm glad someone asked that. So the five-year review, let me start there. The five-year review is not the same thing in an SSA in that a five-year review is a, is a requirement by the Endangered Species Act. It's a policy determination that we have to make and we have to publish in the federal register for listed species. So every five years after a species is listed, we're supposed to publish a five-year review where we're, we're checking up on the species to make sure that either it doesn't need to be uplisted or downlisted. We're just we're kind of checking on the species, or maybe it doesn't meet the definition of teary at all. We can we can suggest um, delisting it. So that's something we are supposed to do every five years, basically to check on the species. The species status assessment is a analytical approach, along with a report that we took upon ourselves to summarize foundational science that we use for all these determinations to include a five-year review sometimes. So SSA is not a requirement. It's not written into any law, policy, or um, uh, regulation. It's something that we wanted to do to try to standardize how we look at the science and data out there to make our Endangered Species Act decision. Uh, and then the court order did not speak to that five-year review. However, since the species remained listed, we chose to use the proposed rule as also to incorporate um, to address the, the need to do a five-year review for the northern longer bat. So because we had done the SSA and we had a recommendation team meeting where we, you know, we said, okay, yes, the species may warrant listing as endangered. So we're going to propose that. Uh, that also satisfied the requirement for a five-year review, that proposed rule. So I know when you go to ECOS or the species page, there's just a mess of stuff for Northern Long Year Bat. So hopefully that helps clarify a little bit. Great, thanks. Uh, another question that came in uh, relates to offshore wind. Um, so do we have any idea on the relative impact uh, of offshore wind on bats um, compared to land? Um, any, I'll take any... this one. <laughs> yeah, so no, uh, but uh, we don't have that question answered largely because we there's uh, been very little sampling effort that's occurred and, and that which has, um, or those data that are out there or currently being collected have not been aggregated. We do, uh, we're expanding the NABAT sampling frame offshore so that those data can be collated in our database and uh, geo-referenced to a grid cell um, parallel with how the rest of our database operates. Um, but one thing that I, uh, when people ask this question that I bring up is that bats are terrestrial species. So when they're going, there's a, a proportion of the population, an unknown proportion of the population that may be traveling offshore and back 
but we don't know where they're coming and going, how far they're going, which species more commonly are traveling offshore. And those are all questions that we want to help answer. Um, but um, yeah, so taking advantage of the sampling that is occurring, um, that may be occurring in relation to project development, if we can aggregate those data, it can help us answer that, that question, along with um, coastal sampling, I think would be really valuable as well. I think just to add on to that, I think we could also look to the North Sea. Um, there has been a lot of research on bat activity um, off at offshore wind um, in Europe. And I think we could at least use that data that's different species, different habitat, but to make predictions about where bats might be in offshore realms of, of North America and could use that to help inform our monitoring and where we think there might be risk versus areas that don't have as much potential risk to bats. One thing I want to tack on to that really quickly is that if we're using acoustics, Amanda and I are just going to like go back and forth. If we're using acoustics that we need to exercise caution when we talk about activity, because we don't know if it's one bat or many bats. Um, and so that's just a word of, of, of caution and, and something that we are very um, conscientious of in our modeling approach with NA bat analyses. Uh, one thing that we do see, just to add to this, is that the patterns of activity offshore are similar to what we see onshore. So we do see greater activity at recording stations um, in late summer and fall as bats are, are migrating or, or staging. Um, uh, and some similar weather patterns are associated with their activity as well. So um, there's still a lot to learn in the offshore environment, but um, we're starting to get some information there, which um, will be helpful as we go forward. Um, let's see. So uh, Bethany um, and, and, and others can chime in here too, but as we're collecting population data, um, and getting a sense of, of how many bats are out there uh, or their occupancy, how do we start to relate this to different stressors? How do we tease apart sure. impacts from wind energy or climate change or any other stressor? Yes, um, so this has been an area of interest that we've been exploring with our R&D strategy and um, thinking quite a bit about, so I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. And so oftentimes it comes up, okay, what's the relative impact or um, to populations from wind energy or, or some other disease, let's say, versus climate change. Um, and climate change is a real tricky one to actually quantify because it's a, it's a you, what you're really needing to look at is a myriad of habitat changes that are, and, and trying to quantify, okay, how are those synergistically coming together to impact populations? Um, and so it might be things like increased aridity, and then we need to measure how is that impacting populations in, and how is that changing in, across landscapes and how is that scaling up to, at the population level and then be able to project that for, into the future. So it's, it's no simple thing. Um, and still to answer that question, our best option is broad scale um, population monitoring using a weight of evidence approach, but where you also have those covariate data through time. So you have that, that temporal scope that allows you to look at, okay, where are there places where we've observed an increase in aridity and can measure how these populations are changing based on this environmental or habitat change that's occurring or, or increase in light and urban development whatever those things might be. And so we are looking to how, and Kathy Irvin from No Rocket USGS has actually started uh, along with other collaborators framing out that analytical approach and something that we hope to be able to pursue and, and parse out. But um, we still need to work together. Like we've been saying since 1999, we need the access to data. We need it over a broad length of time and, and, and space. Um, Ju Juliet, I think you mentioned in your presentation you were interested in in bats during a certain period of time, and maybe that was summer, um, and, and not um, 
at least in your study, using bats that may have been killed at Wind Energy Facility in, in fall. Can you um, talk a little bit about that? And does that, well, yeah. Yeah, just, um, but well, we know these species, you know, migrate long distances in fall. And so um, I, I, my thinking was if I was gonna find any structure in them, it would be using these, where they are in their summering uh, populations. So I, I used, um, there were, there's a study for each of them using her isotope values that uh, lays out when their migratory periods is. So I used the summering ranges and only used samples that were killed or collected during the summering ranges for these species. Um, so that, that did limit uh, some of the samples I could use, uh, but it, it uh, I think made it more likely if there was structure that I would find it. Okay, so if you're not looking at structure, carcasses at different times of the year can still be used for... Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and, and we can use things like, um, like I mentioned the isotopes, for example. So looking at um, if we take fall samples and you can use per isotope to figure out where they're coming from. So year-round samples are definitely useful. Okay. We were. Um, Bethany, you answered that question in the chat. Is that right? Okay. Um, so with, yeah, we've got a couple minutes. So we have a set of wind energy um, already across the country, um, 130 gigawatts, I think. Um, projections, of course, vary over the next 10, 15 years, but some show, you know, up to five, maybe 10 times as much wind energy on the landscape, and this is land-based wind. Um, so we have to accelerate our research. We have to have a better understanding of, of bat populations and, and putting the mortality that we see into context. Do you have, um, and this, maybe I'll just start with Amanda, but others can of course, weigh in. Do you have recommendations for what we need to do from a research perspective to ramp up along with the um, acceleration and in, in deployment? Well, I wish we could accelerate research, right? <laughs> That's the problem is it, it takes time to come up with really solid questions and study designs and collect data. Um, but I think with respect to bats, I feel like progress is being made and there's a lot of active research right now using a whole bunch of different tech, uh, methodological approaches to understand what bats are doing at wind turbines. So it's thermal cameras in conjunctions with acoustic and other kinds of monitoring. And I think really trying to get a better handle on where are bats actually colliding with wind turbine blades. So blade strike detection, I know there's ongoing research that's advancing there to really help us narrow our focus on when, where in the rotoscope zone are bats at most risk might provide new tools or options um, to reduce that it would be one, one priority area of research, I'd say. I want to thread all these things together. I like the questions that we're asking are so big and we've been asking the same question in a lot of ways for two decades. And I think that our best option to answer it is actually to take population status and trends. So where are bats occurring across the, the landscape in summer and winter, perhaps interpolating for edge seasons or including those additional monitoring data for those seasons. But taking the status and trends data and, and analyzing it in, or analyzing mortality data in context of status and trends, not just for determining what um, what is sufficient minimization or where is minimization needed, but also understanding how do these metrics relate? How does mortality and increase in risk relate to population status and trends spatially and over time? And is there a linkage or commonality between covariates? And really try to get at things, instead of looking at one side at a time, taking a landscape level approach that Ideally, we would be able to look forward and predict risk to new sites and uh, taking that, that same approach where we're taking the weight of evidence over time and across space and trying to better understand these relationships so we can predict risk where we haven't sampled before um, or don't have wind energy development yet and then optimize how we develop, how we build, and how we operate that from the get-go. I know it's I know it's aspirational, but I think 
it's possible. Aspirational is good. Um, okay, well, unfortunately, we're at our time. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of other questions we could chat about. Um, I want to thank John, Juliet, Bethany, and Amanda for their time today, and thank everybody for joining the webinar. Um, it'll be posted on, on TIPAS here shortly, um, and we'll continue to work. Um, happy Halloween, everybody, and happy Bat Week. <clears throat> Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.